Uh, welcome everyone. I think we'll get started. Just double checking that I'm not on mute. My name is Julie Bone. I'm the on I'm Ontario Nature's Boreal Program Manager. Today we're going to be hearing about three carbon projects in Ontario and how they are helping to mitigate climate change and protect biodiversity and other conservation values. This webinar is part of Ontario Nature's workshop and webinar series on nature-based -based climate solutions, which seek to mitigate climate change impacts, protect and restore biodiversity, and support human and ecosystem well-being. I'll start this afternoon with a land acknowledgement. I'm based in what is known as Thunder Bay, Ontario, on the homelands of the Anishinaabe peoples, the shoreline of the Gitche Gamut, and the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation. We are all treaty people, and the area where I am situated is covered by the 1850 Robinson Superior Treaty. Through this land acknowledgement, our intent is to honor and show gratitude to the original stewards of the land as a small symbol of our willingness to reconcile the impacts of colonialism on Indigenous peoples. And we acknowledge our responsibilities both to the land and Indigenous communities. And at Ontario Nature, that includes our commitment to working within an ethical space, respecting and learning from both Western science and Indigenous knowledge systems, and supporting Indigenous-led conservation initiatives. And I'd like to introduce our moderator for our session this afternoon, Jenna Cardoso. Jenna is the Protected Places Assistant at Ontario Nature. She is from Cambridge, Ontario, and she studied forest conservation at the University of Toronto. She is committed to protecting Ontario's natural spaces and helping to restore our human nature connections. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you, Julie. Um, I'm really excited about today's webinar, but before we get into the presentations, I'm just going to go over some housekeeping. So we will be recording this webinar presentation and the Q&A for those who cannot attend, um, and in case you experience any technical difficulties. Only those who speak will be recorded, and we ask that you keep muted for the duration of the presentation, as you'll have a chance to ask questions um, once the presentations are completed. You'll notice that there are some Zoom features uh, visible towards the bottom of your screen. And here you will find the chat box. Um, you can add or remove closed captions, or you can use the Q&A feature to ask questions. At any point in time, if you do have a question or something to add, please uh, don't hesitate to, tap it, to type it in. And you can also use the chat feature to message Melina with any technical issues. Thank you all for being here. And if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, um, that would be great. Maybe let us know where you're calling in from today. Um, I'm gonna just briefly go into some context about today's webinar. So we know that ecosystems like forests, wetlands and grasslands are increasingly recognized for their essential role in absorbing and storing carbon. And these nature-based climate solutions provide us with an opportunity to work with nature to address two of the biggest crises of our time, climate change and biodiversity loss. Carbon assessments play an important role in quantifying carbon storage and sequestration of ecosystems. And as you will see, there are multiple pathways to assessing carbon. Today, we'll hear about the different carbon projects happening in Ontario and the various approaches that are being used to quantify carbon. Um, we're really excited to have Bill Thompson, Graham Smith, and Lauren Moretto with us today to share about the carbon work they've been doing. Bill Thompson has a bachelor's degree in environmental science from Trent University and a master's degree in botany from the University of Manitoba. He is the manager of watershed plans and strategies at Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, where his role is to coordinate and support the work of colleagues and external partners in developing and implementing plans to protect and restore the health of Lake Simcoe's tributaries and aquifers. Graham Smith is the Nature-Based Climate Solutions Analyst for Ontario Nature. His work focuses on, ev on evaluating areas of conservation interest to determine their contribution to climate change mitigation. He is also in the process of completing his Master's of Science in Environmental and Life Sciences at Trent University studying habitat suitability for salamanders on Peely Island. And we also have Lauren Moretto, who is a technician of ecosystem goods and services in the Ecological Goods and Services Program at Credit Valley Conservation. 
Lauren's work encompasses research and tool development to quantify ecosystem services, which will be used to inform sustainable management of natural assets and climate change mitigation efforts. So I'm really looking forward to today's presentations. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Bill from Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, who is going to talk about nature-based climate solutions and the Lake Simcoe watershed. Thank you very much, Jenna, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here today. A real pleasure to talk about some of the work we've been doing in the Lake Simcoe watershed to better understand nature-based climate solutions, and, and particularly today, how it relates to carbon sequestration. Um, next slide, please. I, I don't want to assume uh, that everyone on the call today knows what a conservation authority is, although I am looking at the list of, of attendees and I know there's some fellow CA staff here today. Uh, but briefly, for those of you who may not be as exposed to our work, we are watershed based agencies. We work in close partnership with municipal governments, provincial government, uh, local uh, landowners, uh, community groups, etc., to protect and restore the health of our watersheds that flow into various receiving water bodies, be they Great Lakes or inland lakes. Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, we're the uh, kind of the one right in the center of the map there, circled in blue, and we've got that lovely Lake Simcoe in the center as our receiving water body. Next slide, please. So a couple of things to set the stage about the Lake Simcoe watershed, in, in part because these two factors really drive a lot of the results that I'll be talking about today, but also because these two factors are unique uh, to our watershed and probably representative of much of southern Ontario, or, or at least south central Ontario. Uh, and, and one is uh, existing land use and land cover, which is shown in the map on the left of the screen there. Um, so in that map, you can see gray areas. Those are the urban areas, kind of small and mid-sized towns throughout the watershed. Uh, the green areas are natural cover. Uh, so you can see there's a real mix of some areas with extensive natural cover and some areas where it's quite fragmented. And then the tan behind that is, is farmland, right? So that mix of farmland, forest, and small to mid-sized communities, again, not that atypical for Southern Ontario. Compare that one then with the map on the right, which shows development pressure on our watershed. Uh, again, the current urban areas are shown in, in gray and the areas slated for growth and development uh, over the next 20 years or so are shown in purple. So uh, lots of growth and development happening in our watershed and obviously will have um, implications for climate change, but again, not atypical, nothing unique about our watershed. This is fairly standard for areas situated like us on the uh, edge of the greater Toronto area. Next, there we go. Uh, so as a conservation authority, of course, we've been you know, doing work since we first began in the 1950s that ultimately has an impact on climate change, whether it's planting trees or, or educating kids or, or buying and managing properties. But in 2016, uh, we decided to focus up on climate change and really make sure we were putting effort uh, where it was valuable. And so my team was tasked with developing two strategies, one around climate adaptation that looks a bit at how our organization uh, should adjust its programs in, in light of a changing climate, and the other one, which is the carbon mitigation strategy strategy or, or, or sorry carbon reduction strategy uh, which kind of answers asks the question what role does a conservation authority have in reducing greenhouse gas emissions or promoting sequestration within a watershed very early on in that process we made a decision that we weren't going to be getting into the emissions reduction world in our watershed there are groups that do a lot of you know home uh, audits business audits uh, that advocate for, uh, you know, electric vehicles, uh, et cetera. Uh, so we wanted to focus really on kind of a, a more kind of a core mandate for a conservation authority. And so that really drove us towards thinking about land use, land cover, nature-based climate solutions. And so that really begged the question, which is the title of my presentation today, do they matter in, in a landscape of Lake, the Lake Simcoe uh, watershed where you've got a relatively large population and a relatively fragmented uh, natural landscape? Uh, the question isn't just a leading title for a presentation, it was a genuine question we started with. Uh, if we felt there wasn't any value in nature-based climate solutions uh, from a, a climate mitigation standpoint, then it would be kind of a, a non-starter for us. Uh, however, if we thought there was value, then we look at ways we could uh, perhaps uh, do a little bit better going uh, forward into the future. 
So next slide, please. So um, the, the, the reason we, or, or, the, or the way rather we answered that question was by doing a uh, admittedly rough estimate of a carbon budget for our watershed by looking at the amount of carbon dioxide emitted through human activity in the watershed and comparing that to the amount of carbon dioxide sequestered back by natural features in the watershed. And then the obvious kind of third question is shown on the slide there is what's that going to look like as development proceeds over the next 20 to 30 years. So next slide, please. So we were able to partner with a couple of research groups in our watershed uh, to develop some locally specific estimates of carbon sequestration for various ecosystems ty types we find in the Lake Simcoe watershed. So one of the groups was out of the University of Toronto. Uh, the forestry department there um, has a, a, a monitoring program called the VSP protocol, and they over uh, a number of summers had staff and students up to our watershed and they visited over 1200 plots collected a whole bunch of data including as shown on the photo here uh, biomass of vegetation in those plots and they use that information to estimate the amount of carbon stored in forests in our watershed and the amount of carbon sequestered by forests in our watershed on the other side we had a research group from lakehead university in Aurelia looking at carbon sequestration in wetlands and they took a much more intensive approach uh, smaller sample size, but they looked at those um, those sites on a, a multi-year uh, basis to get a sense of how uh, sequestration varied from year to year, and they looked at sequestration both in, in vegetation and in wetland soils. Next slide, please. So under that research, we were able to uh, develop some estimates of carbon sequestration rates for various ecosystem types in our watershed. And again, this is where things are probably not atypical for uh, other similar ecosystems uh, across southern Ontario. So the, uh, the types of rates we're looking at here are, are expressed in terms uh, of tons of carbon dioxide per hectare of that habitat type uh, per year. And so you can see they range from uh, upland deciduous forest, you know, two and a half tons up to cattail marshes being, you know, uh, an order of magnitude larger, up around 31 tons per hectare. And, and we did generally see that the wetlands were sequestering more carbon uh, than the upland forests, uh, largely uh, because of what's happening in the soil in wetlands, right? That, that rich organic soil in, in, in many wetlands is it's carbon that's been uh, that's stored there over the longer term. Next slide, please. So we took those, those, uh, those estimates and we applied them to our, our land cover mapping to develop a map shown on the right of this slide here, which gives a nice kind of visual representation of where carbon is being sequestered in our watershed. So, um, you know, I, I look at that map as someone who's lived and in, 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 in naturalized in this, in this watershed for 15 years and the, the natural areas I know and love are really popping out as being a really uh, a rich purple color. Uh, so not only interesting as a, you know, a naturalist and a bird watcher, but very important as a, as a carbon sequestration feature. We can also look at it on a more quantitative basis as shown in the, the pie chart on the left there that estimates on an annual basis how much carbon might be sequestered by these natural features. And you can see that nearly three quarters of it is uh, sequestered by wetlands. Um, that's not surprising, perhaps. Um, much of the natural area in our watershed remaining is wetland. Those are the areas that you know have been hard to farm and hard to develop, so they tend to remain on the landscape. But again, as you think back to the last slide, uh, wetlands do a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to carbon sequestration. At the end of the day though, because of this, we know that we're sequestering about 900,000 tons of, of carbon in our watershed, uh, carbon dioxide, I should say, um, which is impressive, but uh, still doesn't really answer the question, does it matter? We had to, to balance that um, sequestration estimate with an emissions estimate. So what we did with the emissions estimate was we uh, scaled down this uh, national inventory report that the Environment Canada puts out, or, or at least at one time put out on an annual basis to our watershed. So this is a very detailed report where they report emissions on a sector by sector basis and a province by province basis. And we could downscale this to the Lake Simcoe watershed using our, our land use mapping and using population numbers to, to get a sense of how much greenhouse gas might be emitted in our watershed. Now, admittedly, this is a, a bit of a back of the envelope approach. Uh, however, we have the luxury in our watershed of a number of municipalities who have done much more detailed studies. Uh, including going to the energy providers to get a sense of how much you know fuel is sold, how much electricity is sold to, to residents in those municipalities. And we can compare our rough estimate with their more precise estimate. And we found, in fact, we were within a few percentage points. So you know, the quick and dirty was, was good enough for our, our kind of broad question around, does it matter? 
And that allows us to, to um, develop the uh, graph shown on the next slide, which compares emissions in the watershed with sequestration in the watershed. And, and so in fact, we found that about 20% of the carbon dioxide emitted through human activity in our watershed is sequestered back by natural features in the watershed. So obviously it's not all of it and you know we shouldn't expect it to be all of it because obviously climate change is happening but it's a long way from nothing right so it, it did reassure us that in fact uh you know the, the nature-based climate solutions uh, concept is a, a relevant concept for the lake simple watershed and again probably a relevant concept for similar landscapes elsewhere in southern ontario and it meant that you know as an organization like a conservation authority with a focus on on managing nature managing landscapes that there were levers we could pull uh, and, 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 and you know, approaches we could take to contribute to the fight against climate change. Next slide, please. So we took that understanding and, and drafted up what we ultimately called a climate change mitigation strategy for the watershed, which really kind of helps us focus our effort on ways we can, as I said, perhaps do a slightly better job in the future on, on maximizing carbon sequestration through our programs and services. So including looking at things like uh, pursuing restoration opportunities that might maximize or optimize sequestration, particularly around wetlands. Again, we, we've seen the wetlands are the heavy lifters. Uh, and so we started to ramp up some of our wetland restoration programming. We know as well, though, that these are estimates and, and they are perhaps loose estimates. And that's fine for answering a, you know, a broad question at a watershed scale. But if we're wanting to influence local decisions at a, you know, a neighborhood scale or a particular property or a community, we need to have much tighter numbers, much more defensible numbers. And so where we're at now in the process is really kind of trying to uh, enhance our understanding and really refine our, our estimates of how much carbon dioxide is, is being sequestered by natural features. So one of the things we're doing is, is shown on the, on the next slide. And that's a partnership with uh, our, our neighboring conservation authorities, uh, Credit Valley Conservation and the Toronto and Region Conservation to develop what we're calling a natural asset carbon assessment guide. And now my colleague, Lauren from CBC is here today and she's gonna be talking about this a little bit later. Uh, but briefly, this is a, uh, a, um, a project we kind of undertook to make sure we were being consistent in the advice we gave to our colleagues and our external partners around how to estimate carbon sequestration and, and the best approach to take to answering questions of, of various sources, uh, sorts rather. And so again, the, the intent here is to be a little more consistent and a little more precise in, in terms of the advice we're giving to our, our external partners. Part of this is a literature review to kind of expand out our understanding of the types of sequestration rates uh, uh, that might be found in Ontario or, or areas like Ontario. Next slide, please. I would like, however, to uh, refine our understanding of the sequestration happening in our watershed. Uh, as I said, we had these two really good studies that have, have been done. Um, they were undertaken by two different research groups with two different approaches, and they, you know, each approach has its, its pros and cons. I'd really love for us at some time to follow up with these studies and, and kind of uh, collect a little more data. So for example, the, the four study, again, tons of plots, but really just one point in time, but very interesting. These plots have all been geo-referenced to go back, you know, 10 years, 15, 20 years after the fact, document changes in biomass in these forests and really kind of use that to estimate the amount of carbon sequestered by those forests and look at how, for example, the composition of a particular forest and may drive sequestration rates or, or the site conditions of a forest may drive sequestration rates. On the wetland side, it was much, a much more detailed study, but that meant a, a smaller sample size. So in some cases, it's really just one data point in a particular wetland type. So it'd be nice to get a better understanding of the range of variation in, in wetland sequestration. This is very much a wish, a wish list item for us right now. It's a, a, an expensive undertaking. Um, so we need to have um, that next opportunity with a research group to take that on. Uh, one item that, that is on the to-do list now is the um, this question here, which is around how, how restoration projects contribute to carbon sequestration. Again, thinking about the levers we as a conservation authority have to pull, habitat restoration is an obvious one. Um, but the question is, uh, um, how, to what extent does a young 
ecosystem, whether it's a wetland as the one shown in the photo here or a grassland or forest, to what extent do they mimic a, a mature established ecosystem in terms of the carbon sequestration they do or they accomplish? And perhaps at what point does it start to mimic a, a, a mature system? So this photo, for example, is a, a wetland uh, um, on the Cothy Mulock Reserve owned by Ontario Nature near Newmarket. We had the opportunity a number of years ago to work with Ontario Nature to establish some wetland pockets in kind of a low naturally wet area of on the on the property and now we're entering a new partnership with with Ontario Nature to track a sequestration in these features over the next five to ten years and that'll really help us understand and refine um, what we're able to do around uh, climate mitigation through our restoration program next slide please and really this comes down to this the final bullet here is trying to I, I say municipalities but think decision makers more broadly assist them in understanding what can be done uh, through the, the, the conservation the, the expansion of natural features through uh, or, or to rather contribute against the fight against climate change. And it's, I think, a very interesting time for this type of conversation. Uh, we're seeing in our watershed, lots of municipalities are setting uh, targets for emission reduction and developing plans for how they can reach those targets. And they're finding it very difficult to meet those targets through emissions, emission reduction alone. And they're very interested in, you know, to what extent can, can nature-based climate solutions add uh, to those efforts. Uh, as yet, they're hesitant, um, I, I think it's fair to say, to include nature-based climate solutions in those plans because they're not comfortable uh, or confident yet in some of the science and some of the processes around estimating sequestration in natural features and ensuring those natural features stay in the landscape. But they're very interested and open to that conversation. So I think the time for, for this type of, uh, of research, for this type of uh, webinar today is, is, is right, and it's kind of an exciting time to, to be working. I will, uh, I, I guess, wrap up with a couple of caveats, though. I, I think it's important to remember. Next slide, please. Uh, the one caveat is that nature-based climate solutions are not the panacea for solving climate change. So I showed you earlier that, that bar graph that showed emissions versus sequestration in our watershed. Uh, and I also mentioned that, you know, with growth and development, the obvious question is what happens as development proceeds. Um, what, forward one, please, Jenna. And so as part of our analysis, we did a couple of uh, back of the envelope um, kind of bookend scenarios, uh, one called, you know, a business as usual scenario. If population grows as projected, but nobody does anything, well, you can see the, the, the estimate of, of carbon uh, dioxide emitted, or I guess uh, yeah, carbon dioxide emitted on an annual basis. It's going to, you know, it's going to ramp up just the same as population ramps up. The other bookend is the targets met scenario where, you know, we as a conservation authority really buckle down on our habitat restoration work. We buckle down on the, on the green infrastructure work. All, you know, municipalities and private industry buckles down on their various uh, emissions reduction targets. And in fact, in that targets met scenario, we do see that the population in our watershed increases and net emissions are reduced. Not perhaps enough, um, but they are reduced. But you have to look pretty closely at that at that bar, uh, the targets met bar, to see that that green part of, the, part of the bar has increased. It has, but you have to really kind of squint to see it. And that's because, you know, getting that next hectare of habitat is very, very difficult. Uh, the big wins on climate change really are on emission reduction. And I think it's important to not lose sight of the importance of electric vehicles, you know, living closer to where you work, you know, you know better insulation in your homes. All of that is critically important. Nature-based climate solutions are kind of that last little bit you can't achieve through emission reduction alone. And then the second caveat, uh, next slide please, is uh, the nature-based climate solutions also aren't the panacea for solving the biodiversity crisis. So, you know, as Julie said in, in introducing this, uh, this webinar, th there's certainly an overlap between the two interests, but it's not a complete overlap. So I showed you this, this table earlier and, and kind of the rate of sequestration we see in natural features in our watershed. What we don't talk about a whole lot, and which I didn't share earlier, was Phragmites. So uh, one more, Jenna, please. We, we were curious, though. So we had our research partners look at Phragmites, and in fact, they found it sequestered more carbon than any other ecosystem type in our watershed, or, or, or plant community, I should say, in our, in our watershed. Does this mean that as conservation authority, we're going to be promoting Phragmites? No, absolutely not. That's not an acceptable trade-off between biodiversity conservation and, and fighting against climate change. I think, though it's inevitable, we'll find other trade-offs aren't as clear-cut, and I think we may find ourselves at some point on a you know a property-by-property -property basis having to make some very 
difficult decisions around, is it a, you know, most important to fight climate change and most important to fight against biodiversity? And I think it's, you know, important that those of us in the, you know, in the nature world don't lose sight of the very important fight against the loss of biodiversity as we're taking on this, you know, arguably newer fight against climate change. So I recognize I've kind of perhaps ended on a, a bit of a downer with the two caveats. So I'll just, in, in, in finalizing, just wrap back to my original question, do nature-based climate solutions matter for the Lake Simcoe watershed? Yes, they do. And they probably matter where you live and work as well. So, you know, I, again, as a conservation authority, as, you know, a group like Ontario Nature or, or naturalist clubs or, you know, municipalities or friends of group, anyone who has an involvement in, in or, or, or passion for preservation or enhancement of nature, there are things we can do uh, to contribute to the fight against climate change. So, Again, thank you very much for uh, the invitation today, and I'm looking forward to hearing the other two presentations and to uh, having a bit of a panel uh, later this afternoon. Thank you so much, Bill. Wow. Um, that definitely provides some food for thought, and thank you again for such an informative presentation. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Graham from Ontario Nature, who will talk about his experience with assessing carbon in Forest Stewardship Council candidate protected areas to advance protected places in Ontario. Welcome, Graham. Great. Thanks, Jenna. Um, so we can go to the next slide. All right. So as many of you probably already know, the Government of Canada has committed to protecting 25% of lands and waters by 2025 and 30% by 2030 as part of various uh, national and international commitments to fighting climate change. Currently, 13.5% uh, of Canada and 10.7% of Ontario is protected. So multiple sectors, including federal and provincial governments, nonprofit organizations, and conservation agencies need to mobilize to advance opportunities for protected areas. Next slide. So one opportunity for increasing protected areas is through a voluntary certification in the forestry sector. Uh, Forest Stewardship Council is a world-renowned forestry standard that provides enhanced social and environmental safeguards to forest management planning in return for preferential marketplace access through um, labeling and preferred purchasing agreements with large companies like Staples, Home Depot, and IKEA. Uh, 81 countries across the world have at least one forest management certification, including Sweden, the United States, and Canada. And as part, as, as part of FSC Canada's National Forest Management Standard, FSC certified forestry companies are required to identify 10% of their forest that they manage as designated conservation lands and work within their sphere of influence to have these areas permanently protected. The permanent protection of these lands across Canada could potentially um, protect billions of tons of stored carbon in addition to protecting biodiversity and providing economic benefits. So we aimed to estimate the amount of carbon stored in these designated conservation lands identified through the FSC certification process in the FSC certified forest in Ontario, which span at least uh, 1 million hectares in Ontario. And we wanted to support decision-making on areas of conservation priority by determining the extent to which these designated conservation lands could contribute as nature-based climate solutions through the protection of carbon stores and providing habitat for species at risk of extirpation and extinction. So it's previously been found that most carbon is stored in soils. Um, there isn't as much oxy oxygen deeper into the ground for microbes to use to break down organic matter. So carbon stays within this partially decomposed plant material and colder temperatures can also slow down decomposition, allowing more carbon to stay in the soil. Across global ecosystems, the highest amount of carbon uh, biomass has previously been found to be in forest and wetland ecosystems, as shown in this infographic of global carbon storage. And the distributions are similar in Ontario, where forested, forested systems store the highest amount of above-ground carbon, and wetlands and peatlands store the highest amount of carbon in soils. Uh, 
Next slide. So we aim to calculate the average and the total carbon storage across all of the FSC designated conservation lands in Ontario using a variety of modeling approaches that have ranging complexities. So the World Wildlife Fund model was published in 2021 by World Wildlife Fund and McMaster's remote sensing lab using long-term uh, satellite data to create a national carbon map. Um, ARIES, which was created by the Basque Center for Climate Change in collaboration with the United Nations, uh, which is a software platform that measures ecosystem services in physical or monetary units using machine learning. And finally, we use the INVEST carbon storage and sequestration model, which was developed and hosted by a group at Stanford University. And it uses maps of land use types and carbon stocks to estimate carbon that's uh, stored in a landscape or sequestered over time. So uh, generally completing a carbon storage assessment will require data from all of the carbon pools and land cover types of your area of interest. So uh, carbon is stored in four pools above ground in leaves, branches, and the trunk of uh, trees, below ground in the roots, dead organic matter in leaf litter and dead plants, and soil carbon. So for the models that we used that required data sets, we used uh, land cover data from the Ontario Land Cover Compilation. And um, there is a variety of carbon biomass data sets that are available, but on the screen are the data sets that we used for the models that we ran for each carbon pool. Um, we weren't able to find a provincial data set using dead organic matter, but above and below ground biomass data was taken from the Oak Ridge National uh, Laboratory and soil biomass data was taken from the database published by Tourniquet and LaSalle uh, for the Eastern Cereal and Oilseed Research Center. Next slide. So like recent studies, we found that there's a large amount of carbon sto stored across Ontario, including in the FSC designated conservation lands, uh, wetlands and forested ecosystems, including bogs and coniferous forests stored the most amount of carbon. Uh, FSC designated conservation lands store um, 405 million to a billion tons per hectare, or sorry, a billion tons in total. Um, for comparison, this could be equivalent to the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions that Canada produced in 2020. And these areas store more carbon than the surrounding forest licensed for industrial logging with the invest model showing significantly more carbon in the designated conservation lands. There are over 48 million hectares of FSC forests in, in uh, Canada, indicating that there's an enormous opportunity to protect uh, FSC designated conservation lands across Canada to contribute to the federal government's uh, commitment to protect 25% of Canada's lands and, and waters. Next slide. So there are at least 147 individual FSC designated conservation lands in Ontario, again, spanning over 1 million hectares um, and across 15 different forest management units in Ontario, mostly in Northern Ontario. And the FSC designated conservation lands in the far north and boreal forest region tended to store the most amount of carbon, uh, likely because of the high amount of carbon that's stored in peatlands and wetlands. Next slide. So these are the few of the sites towards north, northeastern Ontario, which store some of the highest amount of carbon in each of the models that we tested. On average, the FSC designated conservation lands stored between 340 and 875 tons per hectare with these sites on the higher end of that range, um, potentially more than the mangroves in the Amazon River. And again, wetlands like bogs, swamps, and fens, and coniferous forests stored the most amount of carbon. Next slide. So it's important to note that there are some limitations to the models that we used, as there are in all modeling approaches. Uh, most carbon storage models illustrate a simplified carbon cycle at one particular point in time where all land cover types are at a fixed carbon storage level. And the output is only as detailed and reliable as the input data that you use. So we compared our findings to other published literature. Uh, some of these reported values were lower than our findings, but some 
did use a shallower soil depth. So they weren't incorporating as much stored carbon as we did to soil depth of one to two meters. However, despite this variation in results, the trend across all, all models was consistent, showing um, a high amount of carbon stored across Ontario. Next slide. So this summer we'll be conducting, conducting field surveys across Ontario to, to confirm carbon biomass estimates used in carbon in the carbon assessments that we uh, ran. Uh, we'll be sampling above ground and soil biomass to estimate the carbon that's stored in these pools at some of the FSC designated conservation lands and uh, some of our nature reserves. Specific measurements of the tree species in a variety of land cover types will be taken as well as soil samples, which will get sent to a laboratory to analyze the total carbon content. And then this data will be used to verify the accuracy of the national and global data sets that we used in our models to ensure that their reported values coincide with the estimates that we calculated. Next slide. So, oops. so Canada has made a variety of uh, commitments to tackling climate change and reducing emissions with, um, and the large amount of carbon in these areas would directly contribute to these uh, commitments. Uh, at the recent COP26, the government of Canada committed to using nature-based solutions to address climate change and biodiversity loss. Uh, Canada also committed to halting and reversing forest loss and land degradation by 2030, and recommitted to the global target of conserving 30% of the world's um, lands and oceans by 2030. Canada has also recently joined the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, whose central goal is achieving that 30 by 30 global target. Um, the government of Canada acknowledges that protected and conserved areas act as a safeguard against additional releases of carbon um, that could derail Canada's progress on climate change mitigation. And additionally, Canada has developed a federal sustainable development strategy for 2022 to 2026 in order to advance the sustainable development goals from the UN. Um, one of the goals is sustainably manage lands and forests, which includes protecting and conserving natural spaces. So the permanent protection of these FSC designated conservation lands would directly contribute to these national and international targets and commitments. Um, they also provide habitat for many species at risk, like Canada warbler and boreal caribou, and they protect areas of cultural and spiritual significance for Indigenous peoples when they're co-created with them. Next slide. So uh, we're continuing to evaluate carbon storage and improve the accuracy of our models. Um, it's clear, however, that FSC designated conservation lands present a clear opportunity to combat climate change through the protection of these carbon dense ecosystems. Across Canada, the permanent protection of these sites would keep millions, if not billions of tons of carbon in the ground. Last slide. And just before I end my presentation, uh, I'd also like to say thank you to the, the funders who are supporting this work and our webinar and workshop series the Metcalf Foundation, the Career Launcher Internships Program supported by the Government of Canada and Ontario Nature's donors and supporters. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Thanks for that great presentation. Um, I would like to welcome our final presenter who is Lauren from Credit Valley Conservation. And Lauren will talk about the natural asset carbon assessment guide and toolbox that Credit Valley Conservation has developed in partnership with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority and Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. Um, and we'll also get to see a couple of case studies. So um, welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Jenna. I'm glad to be here. I uh, work in the Ecosystem Goods and Services Program at CBC and uh, we do a lot of interesting work. Part of the work we do is tied to um, looking at carbon um, sequestration and storage provided by natural assets. Next slide, please. So today, um, as Jenna mentioned, and as Bill mentioned in this presentation as well, 
I'm going to briefly introduce the, the collaborative work that we've been doing with LSRCA and TRCA, um, Toronto Region Conservation Authority and Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, to create a guide and toolbox, a natural asset carbon assessment guide and toolbox. So I'll explain why we've uh, decided to create this, what it is, and um, provide a brief overview of the structure of the guide and toolbox. And then I'll shift focus to um, look at two case study applications of some of these tools in this toolbox that CBC has been undertaking, um, one at the landscape scale, and then one on the other end of the spectrum at the, the local scale as well. Next slide, please. So why create a guide and toolbox? Next slide, please. So we recognize that, um, as Bill mentioned in his presentation, um, our jurisdictions are very rapidly urbanizing. Um, at the same time, our partners, our conservation authorities and several others are recognizing the importance of um, natural assets. Natural assets in the ecosystem goods and services world, um, this is a term that refers to natural resources or ecosystems uh, these are managed and they provide a municipality or other partners um, with benefits and services. So I will use this term natural assets throughout uh, the presentation. There's the definition, but again, we're realizing that these are important. They provide benefits and services to us and with interest um, in, again, like pop, um, the, the, climate change interests and um, recent talks about climate change mitigation efforts, um, we realize that we need to protect these. So in light of urbanization and interest in protecting natural assets for the many services they provide, there's also a lot of tools, methods and resources um, that are being output tied to carbon assessments. And a lot of individuals are eager, eager to apply these tools, methods, and resources, but it can be uh, quite overwhelming um, with the variety that is out there. And there can be a variety of results and misapplication. So we've decided, again, um, our three conservation authorities wanted to achieve uh, some sort of standardization of estimates with the outputs of carbon assessments and we hope to build upon this natural asset carbon guide and toolbox, um, you know, as more tools come out and as we learn more about uh, carbon sequestration, storage and emissions as well. So this guide and toolbox is coming out in a few weeks. Um, we're proud to have it uh, completed and happy to share it uh, when it comes out if there is interest as well. Next slide, please. So just a brief overview of the guide and toolbox to feature some of the key um, components. Um, we have generally this, this guide and toolbox is broken down into three sections. Uh, the first section being kind of a background rationale objectives of why we created the guide and toolbox. And then section two and three are, are really the key components where section two is focuses on the results of an extension extensive literature review um, where we've extracted uh, land cover based data about um, carbon storage and sequestration for a variety of land cover types. And then in section three, this is where the, the guidance um, comes in regarding the application of these tools, methods and resources. So there are a few tables there that uh, help with that. And so next slide, please. I'll briefly walk through um, some excerpts from this document. Uh, this is an excerpt of that uh, table in section two um, containing land cover based carbon data from the literature review. And in the first co four columns on the left, um, these describe the land cover type in a variety of different ways that um, individuals reading this report can apply to their own mapping. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, we include uh, ELC codes. ELC is the Ecological Land Classification, 
Um, it's a means of essentially classifying and mapping different land cover types. Um, and it's a means of mapping that uh, several conservation authorities and other organizations use. So we've provided uh, codes that are associated with that mapping as well um, to allow for as much specificity in this application as we can. And then in the middle two columns um, bolded are um, kind of the, the most essential information related to carbon storage and sequestration. However, we do contain an appendix with a variety of other information when it was mentioned in the literature review, um, including some specific above and below ground estimates, um, estimates of, of biomass, um, roots, et cetera, and sequestration and storage associated with those as well. But um, this is information that is quite often required to be input into um, a variety of models. And so we kept uh, the sequestration and storage um, up front. And uh, we have references and locations of studies, of course. We also decided to include a competence ranking. This is on the far right here. Um, the importance of this document was uh, local application of these rates. Now, we are confident that these rates can be applied across uh, Southern Ontario in most cases. So we wanted to include a confidence ranking um, that reflected our confidence in applying these rates locally. And this confidence ranking is based on the recency of the publication or publications um, the species, the climate, environmental factors, et cetera, because we know that these can all affect uh, carbon sequestration and storage and lead to very different estimates in different localities. Next slide, please. So I'm just gonna provide a brief overview of some of the main tables in section three um, that pertain to guidance for tool selection. So this is the first table we have here and it allows a user to essentially select a tool based on um, minimum data requirements and the um, spatial extent of the application. So quite often, um, many projects might have wonderful detailed data sets and they need to work with these data sets to conduct uh, carbon assessment. So this table would be ideal for uh, those cases and help guide a user to select a specific tool of interest. Now, again, I will note that the tools that are included in this um, guide and toolbox are not all of the tools, but rather are tools that our conservation authorities quite uh, regularly rely on for our own applications. However, as time goes on and new tools are developed, uh, we will add them to the guide and toolbox. Next slide, please. So, we have a second table here then that really looks at, uh, takes an output based approach um, to guiding um, the application of these tools. So if you're looking for a specific output of a project, you're going out, you're collecting data in the field, uh, this table here can help guide the user um, in selecting the, the appropriate tool for that. Next slide, please. And of course, all of these tools that are mentioned are actually hyperlinked to this more detailed account. This is just a snapshot of uh, one of these detailed accounts here um, for one of these tools, where we provide more details about uh, the methods, the inputs and outputs required, some limitations, and a link in reference to the tool itself. So uh, this can help provide further guidance about the application of the tool. Next slide, please. So that's the guide and toolbox. Um, again, this, this um, document will be coming out in a few weeks. We are just in the means of uh, finalizing the uh, last minute's uh, <laughs> final changes, making final changes to the document. But uh, I'm happy to share uh, the document, the guide and toolbox with uh, whoever is interested when it becomes available. But now I will get into case study applications of a few of the tools, methods, and resources that are mentioned in the guide and toolbox um, with a focus on some of the work that CVC is doing 
We have a few different projects uh, going on at CVC, both with partners and within at the corporate level and within our own conservation authority to mitigate um, emissions and work on uh, eventually getting to net zero. But um, I will feature just again, two of these uh, case study applications. Next slide, please. And one of these um, carbon assessments uh, focuses again on the landscape scale. So um, this is a project that we undertook in partnership with um, Caledon and Brampton. Uh, this project uh, was completed in, in 2020 and we called it the business case for natural assets. And one of the focuses of this project was really um, looking at the variety of natural assets across the landscape and trying to quantify and assign value to the ecosystem services, um, six ecosystem services that these natural assets provided. Essentially, uh, our goal was to, again, create a business case for the protection and management of these natural assets um, to help partners and municipalities essentially um, assign value to them and then therefore uh, make a case for managing them um, in the future. So one of these ecosystem services was uh, carbon sequestration. And for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus in on our Alton uh, case study region. Next slide, please. So one of the questions in this uh, study was how much carbon is sequestered by natural assets in the Alton case study area and what is its value over a 20 year time span? So we're using a predictive model here to take a look at, again, the um, change in value of carbon sequestration over a 20 year time span. Now, one of the unique factors of this business case, or I guess uh, unique approaches of the business case was that we looked at different uh, management and risk scenarios as well. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But I'd like to key in on the methodology before we uh, look at the results of the course. So quite often when we take a landscape scale approach uh, to carbon assessments, it's easier to take um, a average land cover, um, apply carbon sequestration rates across a land cover type. And these are quite often average uh, per area measurements. So we, for the purposes of, of this project, we relied on a literature review to find uh, per hectare per area rates that were tied to very specific land cover types. And although it would be much more accurate and precise to measure carbon sequestration from every individual plant across a landscape, that's not feasible. Uh, you'd have, as, as Bill mentioned in, in his work, in his partnerships with uh, universities, um, you have to have a lot uh, smaller scale approaches to this, and it's very data intensive. So when we take a landscape scale approach, again, uh, it's a, a great means of doing a carbon assessment is uh, looking at an average rate and applying an average carbon sequence sequestration rate across the landscape. So again, we're, we're taking these um, per hectare rates um, measured in tons of carbon per hectare per year. We're multiplying these rates by the area of land cover. And then we're taking an additional step in the business case. As I mentioned, it is a business case. We did assign value, monetary value to these, uh, to the carbon sequestration. And we did so by um, multiplying by the social cost of carbon. And this is a um, value that is provided by the government of Canada, essentially looking at the social implications of carbon emissions and how much uh, monetary value is um, tied to emissions of a ton of carbon. So we use that uh, valuation method to assign a monetary value to the uh, carbon sequestration. Next slide, please. So this is a schematic that really ties all of these pieces together. 
At the top left here, we have the results of uh, the literature review. We partnered with Green Analytics and um, they extracted these values for us. These predate uh, the values mentioned in the Natural Asset Carbon Assessment Guide and Toolbox, but um, the methodology stands and, and these values can be swapped as we find values that are more specific to the region, of course. We use these values again and multiplied them by the measures of area of each land cover type in, um, as, as displayed here in Alton region. And then we took those um, landscape level uh, quantifications of carbon sequestration and multiplied those by the social cost of carbon to assign that value. Next slide, please. Now, as part of the business case for natural assets, we also created an interactive dashboard. Um, the document, uh, the publication and the dashboard are both available. I've provided the link here, but again, you can feel free to contact me and I can send that over. And um, again, we, we were able to predict the value of carbon sequestration across this landscape over a 20 year time span but also under different risk and um, management scenarios that uh, we developed in consultation with the municipal partners to identify, again, which risks to natural assets were most likely prominent. We also have uh, some other uh, quantifications at the bottom, uh, which are means of communicating essentially the benefits of, of management, the costs of management, under these risk and management scenarios. So now, next slide, please. I will jump to the opposite end of the spectrum, the local scale, um, and how we might approach a carbon assessment at a local scale. Um, so now at, at a local scale, I'm, I'm talking about uh, trees here and uh, Conservation authorities, um, and in this case, uh, Credit Valley Conservation conducts planting projects quite often with partners and as part of restoration activities across our jurisdiction. So we were approached by our restoration team um, who wanted to quantify um, additional benefits of their restoration projects um, and wanted to see essentially how much carbon was sequestered by their uh, planting. So we used a uh, carbon calculator tool that is still internal at this time, um, but this tool uh, draws calculations from what is now iTree planting, but used to be the National Tree Benefit Calculator. And these, um, these tools essentially are able to quantify how much carbon is sequestered by a tree, a specific tree species, of a specific diameter. Next slide, please. So again, that question uh, that we were asked uh, by the restoration team was how much carbon was sequestered by CVC's planted trees in 2009 to 2019? And this question expanded, next slide, please, to eventually include um, outreach plantings as well. So, we were able to obtain the total number of saplings and seedlings that CVC had planted across our jurisdiction, again, in both restoration and outreach um, projects. Next slide, please. And then we applied the, the calculator. So again, I mentioned that the National Tree Benefit Calculator, iTree Planting, um, these are tools that uh, are in our toolbox and they're tree-based tools um, that quantify uh, carbon sequestration from an individual tree of a particular uh, DBH, this stands for diameter breast height. And this is um, a means of measuring the, the size of a tree um, so that a variety of other calculations can um, come out of, of this measurement, including growth estimates and things. But, Quite often, um, so we collected all of these numbers. We have a, a great database as part of this uh, carbon calculator tool. 
with uh, 24 species commonly planted by CBC, both deciduous conif and coniferous trees. And you can imagine this is a very extensive database. It um, measures uh, carbon sequestration um, for trees of a variety of sizes. But quite often we don't speak um, in, in DBH. It's, it's hard to um, make that connection. And quite often we are asked uh, how much carbon is sequestered of a tree of a particular age. So we need to make an additional linkage um, between age and diameter at breast height, and we can do so by using an allometric growth equation. Um, so then this connects the dots, and essentially we can uh, directly ask the question, how much carbon is sequestered by a tree of a particular age? And so this forms our extensive database where we have um, annual uh, rates for each of these 24 species all the way up to 100 years of age. So you can picture a database full of numbers and this is great, but this is a little complicated to deal with, uh, you know, in, in measuring um, carbon for a variety of planting projects. Next slide, please. So what we decided to do then is create, um, view this in a different way, where we look at each planting project as an individual stand of trees. And what we can do then is create weighted average annual carbon sequestration rates, where we essentially treat all the planted trees within a project as a single tree with a single rate. And this rate is an annual rate, but this, this rate reflects and is weighted towards um, the trees that are most often planted in that planting project. Next slide, please. So if we have an example planting project here where we plant some green trees, some blue trees, and some red trees, but 70% of the trees planted in this planting project are the green trees, then we would expect the carbon sequestration rate um, to reflect that of the green trees more so than it does the blue trees and the red trees. And that's it, it, essentially what the weighted average annual carbon sequestration rate does. Next slide, please. So if we look at the calculator itself, this is a screenshot of the calculator. We have that um, weighted average annual carbon sequestration rate in blue at the top that averages all of the numbers below. Um, we have a way to input um, the number of planted trees and the percentage or the percentage of planted trees if that's preferred. Next slide, please. And then we use these numbers um, in addition to, you know, inputting how many trees were planted, um, the age of the trees upon planting, the total number of years of analysis to output a grand total um, carbon sequestered um, at the far right. And in column K, essentially, we can also generate the annual carbon sequestered by the amount of planted trees. So this is kind of how the calculator works, ties all of these numbers together to output um, a quantity to estimate how much carbon is sequestered across a time period. Next slide, please. So then going back to our original question, um, we were asked again, how many, uh, how much tons of carbon was sequestered between 2009 and 2019 for the planting projects at CDC? So just as a reminder here, we planted um, close to 300,000 saplings uh, during this period and even more seedlings, about um, close to 700,000 seedlings. And now when we add, when we quantify um, seedlings and saplings. Of course, these are trees of different ages. And when we quantify how much tons of carbon they sequester, that's equal to almost 10,000 tons of carbon across this time span. Next slide, please. This is essentially equal oh, <laughs> to almost 8,000 cars, uh, the emissions of 8,000 cars um, driven in a year, taking them uh, off the road 
Next slide, please. You can see the car driving off the screen there, but uh, again, representative of what nature-based solutions um, can achieve. But as Bill mentioned, it's not the only answer, right? Um, there are other practices that we need to establish as well um, to really hone in on climate change mitigation efforts. And there are a variety of means to do this. Um, but uh, again, this is just to exemplify um, two of the projects that CVZ has undertaken with our variety of project partners here, um, just to um, begin that talk about quantifying um, carbon and assessing carbon across the landscape, but also, also at the uh, individual tree level as well. But so, uh, of course, we would like to thank our project partners, uh, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, also Lake Simple Region Conservation Authority, for their hard work on the Natural Asset Carbon Assessment Guide and Toolbox, and then the variety of other um, partners on our uh, Business Case for Natural Assets project as well. And uh, of course, Ontario Nature for inviting us to present and share the work that we're doing here today. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm seeing that there's a lot of um, interest in um, the guide and toolbox calculator. So we'll have to uh, connect you or, or we'll, we'll also probably um, We'll add your email in the follow-up email so certainly all these thanks. folks can yeah can get that um beautiful okay so that thank you for all these great presentations um bill graham and lauren now we have um we have about 20 minutes to go into a q a session so um if anyone has any questions there's a little um button at the bottom of the Zoom screen where you can type in your question and I'm going to um, moderate them. Um, and just again, I want to extend my gratitude to all of our presenters today for sharing their diverse and interesting um, and exciting carbon projects with us. And I think- Oh yeah, this is the end of my slides. There's a okay. few uh, exit slides. Oh yeah, or write down, you can write down Lauren's email. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take the slides off the screen and spotlight um, Bill, Graham, Lauren, and myself, please. And um, okay. There we go. Thank you, Valina. Um, okay. I have a question, I guess I can start off the question period. Um, I was just wondering how much time and expertise went into running these carbon assessments on these projects. And, and that's a question for all of you. <laughs> So I, I guess I'll start as I guess maybe the first presenter. Uh, for us, there was there was a fair amount, right? Because we started with uh, the two research groups out of University of Toronto and Lincoln University. So we really relied on some experts in the field to develop those uh, estimates of, of carbon sequestration. Um, after that, it was pretty straightforward, to be honest. It was largely a GIS exercise, kind of an Excel exercise. Um, so once you've got the, the estimate you're confident in, uh, it's not terribly challenging. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I have another question. Did, did, so the estimates, they change based on your ecosystem type, right? Um, is that dependent on the region? Um, it, it will range a little bit, right? So I think um, soil type matters, right? Uh, really kind of rich, deep soil is very good at uh, sequestering carbon. So if you're talking about um, Southern Ontario versus Northern Ontario, there's going to be a difference in sequestration rates. If you're talking about, you know, Ontario versus the prairies, there's going to be a difference in sequestration rate. Uh, perhaps what matters more, though, is climate, 
uh, and, and kind of the relative growth rate of the vegetation itself. So again, there's um, strong differences between Southern Ontario and Northern Ontario. So estimates like we have, as I said, I suspect they're fairly good uh, for Southern Ontario. Although, you know, the, the literature review we did with uh, Lauren and her colleagues kind of expanded our understanding. Um, but I'd be reluctant to take some of our numbers and apply them to, you know, Thunder Bay, for example, or, or, or North Bay. Right, that makes sense. Thank you, Bill. Um, we do have a question from Michelle Cavanaugh, and uh, Michelle asks, were any of you able to tap into funding for the studies? Oh, sorry. I think I, yeah, and that, that, feel free to just jump in. So, so I'll, I'll start, um, I, I guess I was the one presenter who didn't thank funders. Um, we just used our existing funding. Uh, we, uh, again, it was a, a corporate decision. We wanted to do, uh, a, a develop rather a strategy for our own efforts. So we used ex internal funding for our work. It wasn't externally supported. I think um, ours was a mix of both, um, depending on the project. We did partner with um, uh, the uh, Greenbelt Foundation, for example, for the, uh, um, business case for natural assets um, project and FCM as well. Um, but we also have internal interests as CVC to um, move forward with our climate change mitiga mitigation strategies and do our own research to advance our knowledge uh, in this field. So it's a, a bit of a mix of both. And I guess it depends on um, you know, the, the project of interest and our partners as well, um, if they are interested in conducting carbon assessments, um, they might have funding coming in from uh, different areas as well. But they're not, uh, if it's a carbon assessment doesn't necessarily rely on, I mean, there are, there are projects that uh, do require a bit, a bit of additional funding but as Bill mentioned, uh, once, once a lot of these tools are, are widely available, and as Graham mentioned, um, you can conduct carbon assessments um, quite easily. A lot of these tools, especially the I suite tree of suite of I tree suite of tools, let's try that again, are um, open access tools, and they really pride themselves on. Um, making this information widely available so that it can help with protection, also education of, um, you know, the importance of, of natural features. So um, I don't think that funding should be a limitation in conducting carbon assessments. I know that wasn't exactly the question, um, but uh, just wanted to highlight that as well. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I love that you talked about iTree today. <laughs> iTree is a great tool, um, just even for educational purposes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, no problem, Michelle. Does um, anybody else have any questions? I know a lot of you might be starting out your own carbon projects. Um, a lot of the participants here so now's a good time to ask, ask some of the experts that are doing this work. <laughs> I think a lot of people imagine that it seems like a steep learning curve. Oh, here's, here's a question. Susan um, is curious, curious about how much collaboration occurs or has the potential to occur between regional conservation authorities in pursuit of this carbon data. The traditional lands I represent span several authorities and we would love to know what we are working, uh, what we are working with on our lands. Potential, absolutely, yeah. And I think, that, you know, Lauren and I being kind of uh, together on this webinar as an example of that, we're starting to work uh, amongst the, the three kind of GTA conservation authorities and uh, I don't know, daydreaming about the ability to collaborate on, on additional data collection in, in forests across, you know, Southern Ontario. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think Lauren was very right when she said funding doesn't need to be a limitation. Much of this analysis can be done at a desktop scale. However, if you want to have those locally specific uh, estimates of sequestration, that's when it does get labor intensive and does get expensive. And that's where collaboration uh, across multiple agencies makes a ton of sense. Um, so over time, this may be something that we're able, uh, you know, as 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 a you know the the world of conservation authorities or conservation authorities NGOs working in southern Ontario is maybe something we're able to work away at. Um, and I see that my colleague Joanne has ch um, chimed in into the chat to agree that there is lots of potential to share uh, knowledge and collaboration. Uh, but I'd say uh, probably a, a need to share knowledge and collaboration just because it is such a such a big topic. Absolutely, and and I will add that um, carbon assessments are are not uh, you know specific to a particular conservation authority, and although the numbers might be specific to uh, land cover type, I mean our our jurisdictions are um, small enough that we can transfer um, rates across our board, and I think. It's, it's great because we can standardize our estimates. We can be able to compare our estimates and know that we're relying on the same numbers. Um, carbon sequestration is not, you know, carbon sequestration as a service is carried out by uh, natural features across Ontario. And our, um, our natural asset guide and toolbox and the fact that, you know, our conservation authorities collaborated on this was also a bit of a statement to show that we are interested in, in working together and um, realizing that climate change is, a, is an issue that crosses borders. And, you know, we would like to work with other partners to expand this, to, to make this a, a tool that is, is far reaching and um, where it can be applied, um, we, can, we can achieve that hopefully. And often other conservation agencies or uh, other organizations are already working on a similar thing or have talked about um, doing a carbon assessment themselves and just haven't taken that step. So yeah, just reaching out, seeing um, what stage um, other organizations are at, that could be beneficial. Yeah, and it, I guess it also avoids duplication of our efforts as mm -hmm. well, right? Exactly. So we can we can work together, we can share these numbers, we can develop uh, regional estimates of things um, and therefore put our resources to enhancing the work that we're doing together rather than developing separate tools that ultimately put out the same result. Yeah, collaboration is key, that's for sure. Um, Absolutely. We have a question from Yvette. Um, Bill spoke to contributing to municipal emission reduction targets. Is there thought on how to ensure those nature-based nature -based solutions would need to be additional, real, verifiable, et cetera? Do you think they need to be certified? We are all wrapping our heads around requirements. Yeah, uh, great questions, Yvette. Um, uh, Yes, I guess is a short answer to all of that. It, it does need to be, you know, um, um, additional. It needs to be, um, you know, secure on the landscape if it's going to count towards an emission reduction target. And that's one of the major reasons that I've seen municipalities not included so far is just because um, it's perhaps more vulnerable, more fragile than, than emission reduction itself, right? It's easy enough for a next landowner to cut down a tree. Uh, the next landowner is not going to be taking insulation out of an attic, right? So once you do the emission reduction work, it kind of stays done. Uh, the greenhouse gas sequestration work is a little more vulnerable to future land use change. So uh, I guess the, the question I struggle with sometimes is to what extent does uh, policy protection, which is protecting much of the, the natural area in our watershed currently, is that enough or do you need to ensure that um, uh, features that contribute to municipal reduction targets are on public land and, and managed specifically for conservation? And I honestly don't know, but I, I think those are, those are questions we all need to struggle with. Yeah, 
Thanks, Bill. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, we're we're still at the beginning stages of this. So I think it's a great idea to be uh, following up with uh, other conservation authorities, um, other organizations to see what they're where they're at with this and if they're working on this. Um, no more questions. So I think we'll just wrap up early if everyone's okay with that. Um, I want to thank you all again, Lauren, Bill, and Graham. Thank you again for presenting your carbon projects with us. Um, thank you to everyone who joined us today for our webinar. And thank you to our funders at the Career Launcher Internships Program supported by the Government of Canada um, and the Metcalf Foundation for supporting this series. We will be posting a, re a recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel and we will be sending out a follow-up email that has a link to the YouTube channel and um, a follow-up survey about this webinar. Please reach out if you have any questions. Um, we will add Lauren and Bill and Graham's emails, if they're okay with it, to the email so you can contact them. Um, yeah, so reach out if you have any questions and thank you again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.